Um, he is with Resilient Systems right now. Um, he's done a lot of work with the Berkman Center at Harvard. Uh, we are a fellow there, correct, yeah. for a, a little bit of time. So we're going to have a conversation talking about a little bit of everything that's going on in security right now. Um, just kind of the hacky journalist question, the first one. Um, the foot traffic here at RSA is insane this year. I've heard 35, 40,000 people. You were probably at the first one or, or some of the early ones. What are your earliest memories about the show and compared to today? So I was the first vendor at RSA. I was. It was uh, 2014. It was at the Sofitel at Redwood City. Uh, I just published my first book, Applied Cryptography, and I asked Jim Bidzo, CEO, hey, can I sell my books? He said, sure, put them on the table over there. There was uh, 60 people, maybe 80. We were just talking about crypto. There was no commercial side. I mean, the change here is amazing. And what's interesting to see, I think, as you go around the show, how many non-security people are here selling security or buying security. And this really speaks, you hear a lot of talk about the skills gap. You see it here. You see it in the people who are not versed in our field here because they have to be. They're the security person. I mean, they're just handed the job with no experience, and now they have to figure it out. And I mean, it's hard for us to figure this out. Can you imagine coming to this show not knowing the field? You'll be overwhelmed. What, a dozen tracks, hundreds of vendors, lots of claims, many of which make no sense. And it's really interesting to see us as you know, people in the industry having to work with people who are now here who aren't part of us. I think it's one of our big challenges. Oh, go. It's your own uh, microphone's a good idea. Yes, two microphones, always a good thing. Go to use that one? All right, so his doesn't work very well. All right, we'll play the game. <laughs> We can hand that one back, Bruce. <laughs> All right, so we're heading towards three years post Snowden. We've been talking about going DARP, the, the crypto issue that law enforcement and government has with, with cryptography. Um, now we have the FBI and, and Apple kind of banging heads over unlocking iPhones. Um, how do you think history is going to look back at this period in time and security and privacy? How, how do you characterize what's going on right now? And I've been thinking, thinking about this. I gave a talk earlier today. I don't know if people went to my, my talk at 9. And I'm really thinking about what's happening now and how we're going to be remembered. I think we are very much here in the early decades of the information age struggling with issues that will define this age 50 to 100 years out. And some of it is this interplay between data in the group interest and data in our self-interest. Right, so think about oh, something very easy like Waze. Waze is a navigational system. I use it on my phone. It gets me places faster. It works because everybody who uses Waze is under constant surveillance. Right? That's how it works. So here we have this tool that benefits us as a group by invading our individual privacy. Since so that balance. Or think of medical data. Right? It would be enormous value for us to take all of our medical data and put it in one big database and let researchers add it, yet incredibly personal. Or what the FBI wants to do. You know, let me add your data and I will solve crimes and keep you safer, yet there's the risk of exposing personal data. This balance, this tension between data to us individually, data to us collectively, I think is an extremely defining paradigm here in the early decades of the information age. Right? It's things that Snowden wrote about and things that we're all thinking about. And what I talked about today earlier at, at, the, at the conference of my talk is that this will get much more real as computers start affecting the world more. In a lot of, to a real extent, it's been kind of fun and games here in info security because it's all been about data and privacy. In a couple of years, it'll be about medical devices. It'll be about cars. It'll be about things that can kill us. Not just lose our data. Right? Denial of service doesn't mean you can't get your phone calls. It means right, you die from a drug overdose because your medical device isn't getting the right data. And this will be a huge change. This will cause huge amounts of government inter uh, intervention into our field. This will change everything. You know, it's, it's been easy when it's computers. It's hard when it's things. Cars, medical devices, voting systems, thermostats, traffic lights, right, things that can destroy property and, and, and uh, kill lives are going are gonna to be different. 
How, how much of this is due to the fact that the whole notion of privacy is completely flipped around? I mean, kids share everything on social media. Every device collects all kinds of data. Um, you know, spies are spy. They're going to they're take advantage of that if they can. That's what they do. Um, you know, I, the whole notion of privacy. What, what's happened to it? Well, what's important is the uh, is the cause. And what's important is that computers, by their nature, collect data. Right? Computers generate data just by being on about what they're doing. And a decade ago, all that data would be thrown away because who cares? But Moore's Law happens, data storage drops to free, data processing drops to free, and things we used to throw away we now save. Because it is cheaper to save everything than it is to figure out what to save. Right, so that means all this data is being generated. I had an op-ed Monday uh, on CNN.com, and on my web, uh, on my blog probably tomorrow, which basically argues that data is a toxic asset. Right, that actually having data now is dangerous. You don't want to have data about your customers. Why? Because when you lose it, it's expensive. It's expensive in your image, in, in lawsuits, in direct damages, all the reasons. So think of it as a toxic asset. Uh, I don't know if you know, but like Monday, IBM uh, acquired my company. This isn't an IBM friendly message, but it really is true. So when you think about NSA surveillance or corporate surveillance, they're in a sense piggybacking on this natural tendency of computers to produce data. Right? And we know the story of corporate surveillance, internet surveillance. It's the business model that emerged government glommed onto it. So I think as we start thinking about this notion of data in the group interest, data in self-interest, this, this data toxicity, this notion that collect it all doesn't make sense, that we're going to start making smarter choices. And that's when I think we're going to get our privacy back. I mean, we're losing it not because we, we want to. Right? You know, every one of you has a cell phone. The cell phone knows we are all here. And we are all under constant surveillance, not because it's malicious, because it can't ring otherwise. And having you all under surveillance is a necessary function of a cell phone, otherwise it doesn't work. Right, so how do we now deliberately build in the functionality without losing the privacy, without losing the security? You know, we will, in the next 10 years, be expected to give up our autonomy over driving and we'll do it willingly because we'll save tens of thousands of automobile deaths per year. But how do we do that? Preserving security, preserving privacy, preserving liberty. How do we make that work? That's hard. How, how, this can't be all gloom and doom. I mean, is, is there, are there a positive in the, the fact that maybe security and privacy are no longer going to be considered separate disciplines? Are there, you know, there's a lot more overlap. There are a lot more people are thinking about this problem. What's going on there? So I'm actually not pessimistic. I'm actually, I'm short-term pessimistic, long-term optimistic. I believe we'll solve this. And I think this notion of security and privacy colliding is important. And it's important both good and bad. It means there'll be more government involvement. Right? When, when planes start crashing, you get government regulation. You just do. So that'll be both good and bad. I actually think we need more government regulation. We need a counterbalance to corporate power. And government is how we solve these collective action problems. So the fact that everything's merging, and not just things like security and privacy, but all the trends. Right? This morning I talked about the Internet of Things and cloud computing and pervasive computing. And, and as, I mean, several of us I'm not thinking of right now. Autonomy, uh, action at a distance, algor uh, algorithms. I mean, all of these things coming together are turning this into a very different industry. Right? It's, we're no, computers are no longer separate things, they're everything. And there's enormous promise here. I actually think we will solve this. I don't think that we're doomed. I think this is all going to work out okay. It's going to be just a kind of a bumpy 10 to 20 years, which I guess will be good for the industry. I mean, there are like 40,000 people here, which is kind of scary. Thankfully, it's, not, it's more than you guys. So let's talk about a couple of specific things. Going dark, for example, is the law enforcement term, the catchphrase for their lack of visibility into um, encrypted devices. Um, wh why the thirst for what's on a mobile device when, as your paper that you were involved with pointed out, there are so many other sources of unencrypted data, metadata, 
Internet of Things generated data that, you know, they could pull stuff that might be usable to them from what, what, what's happening. You know, it's interesting. I always can't figure out the FBI's position. I mean, first of all, going dark makes no sense, right? This is the golden age of surveillance. I mean, every one of us now is carrying a personal tracking device 24-7. If the government mandated that, we would rebel as a people, yet we pick up our cell phone every morning and put it in our pockets. And, and pretty much everything we do is, is records data and we're under surveillance about it. My guess is, and this is my guess, that when the, when the FBI talks about going dark, they're very, they're very short-sighted. Right? 50 years ago, this conversation, every conversation, disappeared as soon as it happened. Right? There was no possibility ever of surveilling someone backwards in time, of collecting data on their previous conversations. They were as dark as possible, yet they still solved crimes just fine. Right, fast forward to what, 10 years ago, and there was this temporary blip where suddenly they had access to everything, absolutely everything. And I think they got lazy. I think they actually forgot how to solve crimes any other way that the techniques of actually figuring out evidence and piecing together history were lost because you didn't have to think, you could just get the data. So now, instead of having 100% visibility, at 98% visibility, they're screaming that they're going dark, and it's actually just that they're getting stupid. I mean, what we need, I think, are more technically savvy FBI agents not back doors. I should write that up. Actually, I will. I'm going to write that on the plane going home tomorrow. You'll see it somewhere on Monday. So we heard it here first. But don't, like, don't put it on the web yet. No, no, no. no. We're slow in putting this stuff up. <laughs> um, so Apple FBI. Um, one thing about this story, too, is that you, know, you have Apple making their case about the precedent that this would set if it happens. The FBI leans on the emotional side of it, national security, terrorism, crime, child abuse, all this stuff that's, you know, they're blind to right now and, and as, as far as what's on a device. One thing um, I would like everyone to read, uh, Susan Landau gave testimony to the House Judiciary Committee yesterday. And her written testimony is, on, is linked to on my blog. It is a phenomenally good document. It lays out all the issues, both specific and the more important general ones. If there's one thing to read on this case, read that. Read her piece. It's great. Yeah, I, I've dealt with her before. She's really smart. And um, unfortunately, we were kind of here and not able to see the testimony, but I read a little bit about it. Just as a last thought, I mean, you said you don't know how it's going to come out. I mean, does it end up in Congress? Is it, I mean, where does it go? I think it ends up everywhere. Right? It's going to end up in court. Apple's going to take this to the Supreme Court, which is now a weird court, so who knows how that's going to go. Uh, this is right now in Congress, and I suspect we are going to see bills. So I think this gets fought everywhere. And we have to be careful here, because we can easily lose. Right? Fear can win. We can actually end up, all of us end up with less security, with more cyber crime, with more child predators, with more of those, all those things we think are bad in this weird effort to unlock phones and unlock computers and messages. So this is dangerous. I mean, every company here, this affects every one of us who wants security. So pay attention to this, get involved. You know, we're, we're, we're past the point where tech is a separate world. And as I said earlier, when this starts involving driverless cars and medical devices and things that kill people, this will get much worse much faster. And we are, tend not to be in our country really good at tech policy. We get it right eventually, but initially we tend to get it wrong. Uh, in my talk earlier today, I'm actually advocating a new government agency. And this is a technology now that we need new government expertise, we need to consolidate it. Right? And, and it's not more government involvement versus less government involvement, it's smarter government involvement versus stupider government involvement. The government is going to come into this industry really hard, really fast. And we need to make sure it's done correctly and not wrong, not badly. Great. Some good stuff to leave everybody with. Thank you, Bruce, for coming. Thank you. Very appreciated. Thank you.